Xbox 360 chat pads and bringing back the QWERTY keyboard phone, this time on Hack 5. Hey everyone, Glitch here and welcome back to Hack 5. A couple months ago I found a handful of these Xbox 360 chat pads for less than $3 a piece at a local thrift store. Since then I've been working to make them into USB keyboards, but it's been a bit more of a challenge than I originally anticipated. One of the biggest problems was finding any information on pinouts, firmware, what kind of output that the Xbox chat pad provides, because a lot of the forums and a lot of the reverse engineering efforts has been lost to the ages, various forums have shut down, and information has just generally been deleted or expired on old domain names. However, between Google Cache and a lot of internet archive hunting, I was able to find enough information and even some firmware to figure out how to reverse engineer one of these. One of the other issues I face is that the outline of the Xbox 360 chat pad is a very awkward shape with no straight lines and no regular angles or radii or anything, and they're all compound radius. And so replicating it in CAD so that I could make a 3D printed case for it was very difficult, and I had to use a couple different tricks and about 18 different failed prints to match that radius perfectly, or that outline perfectly. One of my favorite tricks for replicating a difficult shape is actually using a flatbed scanner. This solves a lot of issues compared to simply taking a picture, such as getting a high contrast edge that you can trace in the CAD program, as well as just getting a perfectly right angle. With a camera, you can be off axis by a couple of degrees and that'll completely skew your design. And I did try taking a picture of this one because I was being lazy and didn't want to dig the scanner out. And ultimately, I ended up with about four or five failed prints that could have been avoided. One other detail to be aware of when hunting for a chat pad for this modification is that you need to find one of the oldest generation ones that you can. They used PIC microcontrollers rather than some FPGA that's been globbed on. Not FPGA, they're ASICs. They were made specifically, it's an ASIC, blah, 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 blah. ASIC chip that was globbed on with some uh, black adhesive. And from everything I was able to find, those aren't reprogrammable. Luckily, all of the ones I have are original Microsoft, and even the black ones used the correct chip. Now, because these are PIC microcontrollers, you're going to need a PIC programmer to do anything with them. You won't be able to just program them over serial with a USB dongle you already have. Odds are, though, if you've been doing electronics modding for a while, you probably already have one of these laying around. Now, we're going to talk about the wiring for a moment. I'm not going to go too into detail about it because I'm going to have all the diagrams and programming files in a GitHub down below but I did want to point out a couple of things. First off, over here we have the PIC programming header all nicely broken out. You don't have to go solder random pins to chips. They just have a nice set of programming pads right here. The other thing is we're only going to be using four wires from this connector here. Some of these go to the audio pass-through, which I desoldered on the keyboard, and the others go to the serial header that we're going to be using. We're basically turning this into a serial keyboard here, and we're going to be interpreting that with a DigiSpark clone. Like I said, all the exact pinouts are going to be down below. However, the uh, color diagram here does not correspond to what you are looking for. Red isn't positive, black isn't ground, and the orange wires are not your signal wires. So make sure you check the diagram and reference the actual pins and not the colors of the wires. Now I've mentioned reprogramming here a couple of times and what exactly I mean by that is we're flashing the firmware on the chip because the stock firmware, while it has been reversed, it provides some characters that don't actually fa uh, follow the ASCII protocol whatsoever. And you also need to send bits back to the controller to control the backlight. Well, I wanted to keep this as simple and as much of a self-contained USB keyboard as possible so that it can be plugged into any device and not require any special software to communicate with it. So to do that, we had to use different firmware, and this allows us to have built-in backlight control. It allows all the uh, special character keys to just work, and really, it does just work. It is plug-and-play on Android, on Windows PCs, on Linux. Now keep in mind that this is a QWERTY American keyboard for US-based systems. I don't know the exact details that go into uh, the GB keyboards or any other uh, outside of the US ones because that's what I have to work with. Let's talk for a moment a bit about how I designed the case. Now, I am basing my case model off of the Essential PH1 simply because I was able to very easily model the, the device. It's a very monolithic slab of a phone. The edges are filleted a little bit. 
However, otherwise it's a very simplistic design with very simple radius. Uh, if I wanted to use my Pixel 3a, for example, I would have had to use a reference model that I got off Thingiverse or a GrabCAD. However, that those meshes have a large number of facets and faces that make it very difficult to do a simple Boolean subtract and to get it to print well. So I kept it simple and used a device that I had the CAD for. And basically all I did was I made a slab here on this hinge face and I moved the reference model of the essential pH one into it and did a Boolean subtract. This is all done in Fusion 360, by the way, and I'll have the uh, files for this down below. And like I said, it's set up for a essential pH one right now. However, you can do this with any phone that will fit. The other detail is the hinge is re reinforced with some fillet joints. Now I did have a couple of the iterations break and I tried strengthening it up a little bit. However, I could only do so much. So make sure you use a high wall count and a, as well as a high nozzle temperature so that the layers fuse together really well. The hinge is actually using a piece of filament, 1.75 millimeter filament, the same filament I printed the case with as a hinge joint. And this seems to work really well. It's smooth and it also provides enough friction that it is not going to just flop open or close. The keyboard fits simply in this little recess with a little bit of super glue around the edge. And like I said, this was the hardest part. I'm gonna provide both an STL as well as the Fusion 360 file for this outline. So you can simply subtract the STL file from whatever you're building. It doesn't have to be this case. You can implement this into any project. It is a serial keyboard, so you could implement it directly into a Raspberry Pi or a uh, Arduino based design and use it as a text input. Right now I just have the cables coming out of the side of the case here and running up the side of this. I could have designed a channel, however I do like the kind of exposed wire look and it, let's be honest, it was simpler to design. Other than that, uh, that's really all there is to the case. It's a very simplistic design and the hardest part was getting this outline right. And lastly, I'm sure you're waiting to see this thing in action, so I will turn it on here and I'll just go to color note. As you can see, I've already been typing in here a little bit. Shift H L L O. And then the green key acts as a function key. So, oh, it didn't actually trigger there. Exclamation point. Orange activates all the orange keys. That's like a function too. Backspace works. And the cool part here is the person key acts as a keyboard control key. And what I mean by that is that's how you control the backlight. You can have the backlight turn off immediately. You can adjust the various brightness levels of the backlight. And you can also adjust the backlight timeout so that when the keyboard's idle, it will shut the backlight off. Now I'm sure you noticed these red LEDs here. Those are actually on the DigiSpark. And if you wanted to save maximum power, you could actually have those, uh, you could remove those with a desoldering iron. Oh, and speaking of the desoldering iron, I used a desoldering station, or rather a hot air station, to remove the, or to attempt to remove both of these connectors to make the thing a lot more lower profile. And the biggest issue I had was that this plastic, I'm not sure exactly what plastic it is, but it has a much lower melting point than what I'm used to. And as you can see here, it uh, kind of melted this one, and this one no longer fits in my project. So I ended up switching to just using a uh, normal soldering iron, and heating up all the pads in turn so that the PCB itself got nice and hot. And I uh, just carefully pried up on the uh, plug itself. Now you can theoretically lift a pad if you aren't careful. However, I wasn't planning on using the headphone jack anyway because it's just an audio pass through to this connector. So I, if I lifted a pad, I lifted a pad, wasn't a big deal. Now the cool thing is this case actually has quite a bit more room in it where I could put potentially PSP joysticks or some extra buttons, maybe even some extended battery. So we might be revisiting this in the future. I'm gonna have all the files uh, relevant to this project down below. So if you make one or you use the files to implement an Xbox 360 chat pad into your own project, be sure to share it with me and it'll get included in a future video. Make sure to check out the Hack5 shop linked down below. Thank you all for watching. This has been Glitch, Glitch out. Thanks for supporting Hack5. Find all our shows, community, and Pentest products at hack5.org.